there was a way to cut it down for, for children. And we honestly scratched our heads. We could not come up with a way. For the pigs, what do you do? Okay, we won't show tail docking. We won't show circumcision. We won't show teeth cutting. We won't show hair clipping. Um, we won't, we won't cows. We won't show branding. I mean, what's, what's left? Yeah. And don't shoot the messenger. What, you know, we're not the ones doing it. So, so when those questions come up, I think they're, uh, I think they're uh, a defense. When the person, tell me it's not quite so bad. Tell me you manipulated it just a little bit. Tell me it's something that it wasn't. Yeah. Well, you directed Earthlings in Unity. As we said, you've combed through hours of footage like this. Uh, you frequently attend vigils with the Los Angeles Animal Save. And so how do you personally deal with the emotions that come along with bearing witness like that? That's, that's the question. And, you know, traumatic knowledge. Traumatic knowledge. Well, um, hmm. just to choose my words carefully on this, because um, if, you, if you cannot make it about you, and your pain and your reaction to it, because we're 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 quite, with respect, we're quite good at that in the first world. We're quite good. How difficult things are for us. And if you can just uh, be the conveyor of information, if you could just be the window that the light is trying to shine through, and just keep your window clean, and so the light, the most light can pass through it and not make it so much about you and how you're taking it and how much you can how much you can handle if you can practice that like a yoga or any other practice then uh you could be a filter and as much junk as you want can come in and you purify it and you just send it right back out and you turn it into fuel and that's um because i've seen plenty and um i'm not rattled for a second, there's nothing else I'd re rather do than, because um, when I see them dying like that, I just, how can I possibly say this is, this is something about me? I once took a, a what are those things when you're counting? Like a, uh, like a clicker, yeah, and I once sat <clears throat> for a screening of Earthlings and I wanted to count how many animals actually died in the film. And at times we couldn't do it because they'd be dumping the bodies of seals into a ravine. I don't know how many were in there, but the count was somewhat, somewhere around 500. So in about 94 minutes, about 500 animals die, or roughly a couple hundred per hour if you almost break it down, which is pretty close to the average rate at your average slaughterhouse, ironically. So again, the film is alive on its own. It brings its own rhythm and cadence to things. and. Um, um, how can we not look? You know, as my friend Bobby said, a camera guy I work with, he said, you know, I think the last time he saw it, he said, um, the least we can do is be vegan. Seeing this, and um, he's right, the least we can do, and not make it so much about us. So if you can find that in yourself, you, you can steal yourself in some way, and continue to be the messenger and plant the seeds, and hopefully that'll, that's one way. I know some people are more sensitive than others, so I don't mean to see as sensitive to that. That's a good point. Um, I, I think in, in uh, getting this, promoting this film, uh, or this screening in particular, I think that's one of the things I, I put out there. It's uh, we're, we're putting our feelings aside for a moment and, and bearing witness to these animals. We still get to go home to a warm meal and a warm bed. They don't. Um, on that note, what immediate impact do you want, do you hope that this film will have for anyone watching here today, vegan or not vegan? Right. It's so funny because I was just chatting with um, Matthew Lynch, one of the filmmakers today. He called me and we were just chatting just a couple hours ago and he was saying, you know, is there anything we can do to help, uh, help get more people to see it? And I know where his question is coming from because his question is just coming from a place of compassion for the animals, and so that would be um, minimized and eventually abolished. This is sort of an energetic answer to your question. So I don't know how everybody will take that. It's less concrete. It's just more in the 
vibration, but just the fact that it is and it's out there, um, we may not have to control the level of hype for it. There's no funding for that, and you can't even get the advertising for that if you had the money. It's quite difficult. Um, as you may know, every year, an organization quite large, quite well known called PETA, puts an ad for the Super Bowl. Every year, someone donates the money for it, they shoot it, they submit it, and it's always rejected. Every year. Bless their hearts for trying, continually. Do you know the reason for it? It's not because it's PETA. The reason it's rejected is because the NFL has a rule that no advocacy ads can be shown during the Super Bowl. You must sell something. You must sell something. So here's one of the largest audiences from a nation that is the most powerful in the world with the largest economy in the world and the second largest polluter in the world, not the first. And you must sell something during that ad when all those eyeballs are watching. You can't advocate for children's rights, for animal rights, for women's rights, for equal rights, for any kind of rights. You can't do it. That's um, a failure of will, in my opinion, on behalf of humanity where the almighty, almighty dollar trumps you know, these problems that we have. So it's quite sad. So all you can do is put it out there and let hope, hope that it finds a way to communicate with people and be discovered. Now listen, again, Earthlings had no marketing budget, was rejected by every festival, and basically came out and just uh, died, you might say. I don't know how many people have seen it. I have no idea how it got around the world, but I can tell you that the filmmakers and my colleagues did not do that. We did not actively do something to make that happen. It happened completely, spontaneously, involuntarily on its own. As the level of consciousness gradually rose, people found it and discovered it entirely spontaneously on their own. So all I can say for something like Dominion and other works and other books or films or musicians or works of art or any way you might communicate is that put it out there like a gardener planting seeds, cast those seeds, sometimes the soil is rich and it will rain and grow and the sun will shine and sometimes it's stony ground and it will not grow but keep casting seeds. We're all gardeners to keep casting seeds and that's all you can do. My humble opinion. That's great. Uh, we have one last question, then we'll take it to the audience. Um, why do you think it's important for people who are already vegan to watch a, a documentary like this? Um, if I may, uh, if you don't mind, with a show of hands, how many here are already vegan? Okay, quite a crowd. And if you want to put your hands back up, how many of you were shattered by what you saw tonight? It's a, such an ultra vivid reminder of what's actually happening. And it's still removed. It's still removed because as you can see, this white screen is dead and there's nothing here. There's nothing happening in this room. That's why the vigils are so profound because you can actually come to a place, smell the animals, see the animals, look at the animals, hear the animals, and know that they're walking into this house. They're riding into this house of death, as you say, and then we go home. Something very, very powerful about about not seeing it on a phone or online or in, on a screen, but to actually go witness these things. Once in your life, go see it. However, if that can't be done, watch it. See it, pay attention to it, keep abreast of it. Um, I, I see this, I, where I first saw the first cut when they sent me last year, I just thought, <laughs> my first thought was, um, we're all going to hell. We're all going to hell. Um, there's no hope for us. And um, because I think animals are such incredible communicators and, we, and, our, and our ears are, in, are encrusted, we just don't hear it anymore. It's like they've fallen into disuse. We just don't seem to pick up on it and sense it anymore. We're blind to it. And they're, they're communicating in so many ways and we've been their executioners perpetually, you know. I see stuff like this and I think it ups my game. And I'm on seven days a week. This is, I'm a full-time activist, I think, like many people in the, in the, in the area that I am. And uh, so I, I always look. Just like um, 
Gretchen Weiler, the great actress Gretchen Weiler once said she's long past now, but she said we must not refuse with our eyes what they must endure with their bodies. Again, it's the least we can do is just watch. And I think it makes us all stronger activists. So I encourage, I always encourage activists, just take a look. I've seen it, I know it, I've seen it, I know it. I'm like, we were at a slaughterhouse last year with a, a celebrity. I won't say who it was. But he said to me, he goes, Sean, why am I here? Because I dragged him out there for this. And I said, have you ever stood on the floor of a slaughterhouse before? Before? Have you ever ever actually been in one? He goes, no, but I've seen. I, I've seen. I said, you haven't seen it. You haven't seen it until you walk through it. So he came in until you walk through it. Why would we not want? Why would we not want to know the truth about what's happening? I think it makes us stronger at I don't mean to belabor that point, but I encourage every activist to see stuff like this. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're going to go to the audience. We'll try to get to everybody. If anybody has a question, raise your hand. The mic is yours. Sometimes. Not a single question. Here. Okay. So, um, with the narration choices, did you choose, or did you, like, sought after those people or do they come to you and want to collaborate do you think it like affected the film in a more positive way because of their audience um, I personally think the different narration was awesome regardless of who they were but I was just wondering what you think about that right yeah I mean um, I think some people say it's kind of a tactic and a sellout maybe idea but you have to understand the world you know, they're, we're drawn to our celebrity culture. And so, um, and if celebrities are willing, we did approach them, but they were willing to do it. So we went out and asked a, a few of them. We got no's from a couple others, but we, these are the ones that agreed. And if they even ever stood a chance of getting a distributor or getting it on a delivery platform, you'd have to have something like this because the people who decide that stuff are thinking about markets in different places with certain demographics who won't even bother, who won't even bother to look at it, no matter how fancy the poster is, if there isn't some name that might make them look at it a moment more. So, and all of these people were um, with vegan and animal advocates, and so they agreed to do it. And so they each read, um, Instead of a big chunk, a big chunk, and a big chunk, we broke it up into pieces and kind of let it, kind of mixed it up. Yeah. Is there anyone else? Yeah. It's just real simple. Um, um, what made you become vegan, and <coughs> what time was that? Um, did it happen? Right. I became vegan because I saw footage in the '90s. I saw a documentary called Hearts of Darkness, which is about the making of a film called Apocalypse Now, which is a movie from the 70s that you've probably seen. But if you don't remember the film, there is a scene at the end of the film with Marlon Brando, and he's killed by an assassin. And at the same time, a ritual is happening in that part of the world where they hack a caribou to death, also with a machete. And they intercut the two scenes together. That's what, the, that's what Coppola, the director, decided to do. At the time, there was no humane treatment of animals in film in the 70s, and they hacked a live caribou to death on camera. And if you see the film, it is an actual animal being killed, which was quite common in the 70s. If you watch Patton with George C. Scott, you'll see them shooting birds. If you watch Papillon with Steve McQueen, you'll see them killing chickens. So back then, it was much more common. The documentary, Heart of Darkness, showed how they got the idea for that, and they were slaughtering pigs. And when I saw that, I said, I can't eat pigs anymore. I was raised eating, eating an American diet like pretty much everybody. So I saw footage and in the 90s I stopped and gradually began to educate myself. I guess that's probably why I use footage as a way to teach because it's what it taught me. Anyone else? Anyone else? Yep. Well, it's, uh, if you think about the humane standards that are being proposed by some of those 
in the industry along with groups like Humane Society of the United States. It's not that they are pointless or have no purpose or that it's not a significant step towards reducing the suffering of animals. Just as an example, they have a rule about you have to walk to every aisle of the chickens and uh, look for animals that cannot make it to food or water, which you know would seriously reduce the suffering of some of those dying animals. And I'm afraid that sometimes when we show all these videos, you need to be driving a lot of people to those humane standards. And you know, I'm not sure what the answer is because it is definitely better. But yet I would hope that we would combine an overall vegan message you know, that also talks about reverence for life a little bit more than just focus on the suffering. That's a good point. Um, you made me just think of something. We were just at an immersion in Sedona a couple weeks ago. We were filming something there. It was with the Engine 2 diet, so it was, it was SOS, the diet, so no salt, no oil, no sugar. And uh, there was about 85 people in attendance there. We've been vegan a long time. Um, and uh, I have to say that the SOS level of it, because it was a vegan facility, you know, a vegan event, was next level for us as well, because there's so much awesome vegan fun stuff nowadays that you can eat just to your heart's content, you know, lots of salt and lots of sugar and lots of oil, and you don't have to want for nothing, you know, it's all there. So they took it to the next level, and, um, and I was chatting with Caldwell Esselstyn, who is the heart surgeon of heart surgeons. The guy's been doing heart surgery since Vietnam. 55 years he's been opening up chests and seeing what's inside. He knows his stuff. And we were talking about, this is going to relate to your question, we were talking about um, vegan hamburgers. A couple of big ones that have taken off lately. And he looked me square in the eye and he says, do you think that product is any healthier for the endothelium wall? than an animal product? And the answer is kind of no. <laughs> you know, it's not much healthier. However, I said, well, it's a transition food. People are used to this, and we're trying to get them over here so they can do it. And he goes, how can you call it a transition food if it's killing the endothelium wall, which is going to clog your heart? The point is, um, <coughs> it's like my brother. I love my brother. He's seen everything I know and have to share, and he hunts, fishes, and eats meat. What am I going to do, not talk to him? No. No. He's not ready for it yet. I don't know why. What works for me doesn't seem to work for him. However, he seems to feel a little conscious of their suffering. That's like the vault door got crowbarred open just a little bit and so he's leaning a little bit into grass fed which is a marketing tool more space for the chickens <laughs> but he never even cared before he never even cared and I thought maybe just a little bit of light is getting through so I'm glad there are beyond burgers impossible burgers all these other burgers I'm glad they're there are they ultimately where we want to go? We need to do, <laughs> I'm glad they're there, don't get me wrong. Uh, is it SOS? No. Um, what do we do with humanity? You know, There are people alive today with no empathy. They don't feel empathy. On a DNA level, no empathy. What do we do? Stick them on an island like a group of lepers? Um, no, we have to live with them, so we, uh, we try to influence. I hear you, man. Believe me, I I'm with you. I don't want to have anybody feel complacent and feel okay with kind of continuing to harm animals. And I also like your point about um, only focusing on the suffering, and I know Earthling did, and I know Dominion does. Uh, we've tried other tactics, a um, spiritual approach, a philosophical approach. We try it with sports, there's another film coming out. We try it with the environment. We certainly try it with health. Um, again, I think we have to just keep, to keep trying to see because one book or film might speak to someone that doesn't speak to another. So hopefully that. Yeah. Anyone else? Go oh, Peter and then Peter. Um, I have a question about the 
try to tackle um, sort of the, the government and their involvement in all of this in making your films? Like USDA or also, um, I guess, bigger industries. In USDA and then um, their involvement with Monsanto slash American Meat Association or corn growers. Also, I'm from Iowa. All <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, <clears throat> don't be discouraged by this answer because I think about that too. All right, what's the single most powerful government entity in this country? It's the Pentagon. Hands down, it's the Pentagon. And the second most powerful one is the USDA. Humane Society, pretty big budget. Somewhere between 140 and 180 million a year. Pretty good. Sea Shepherd, tackling the oceans, their budget. PETA, other groups, Mercy, whomever, whatever they're raising, bless their hearts. This will seem impractical, but what's the chance that we possibly have going up against the USDA? The most powerful thing you can do is vote with your fork, is vote with your dollar. It's the most powerful thing you can do. We could make a movie about it, we could write some books about it, we could try to go after it, and we're a mouse fighting the gorilla. And so you try it another way, which is power to the people, and you just inform and educate and hope that they say, you know what, I don't want to buy that anymore. And guess what? There's a new statistic out there for millennials. This is very interesting. 45% of millennials, that's almost 50%, that's one in two people, make purchases based on care. Purchases based on care. They want to know. They don't care about the label. They want to know how it was made. Amazing. Unbelievable. Makeup companies especially, because the young kids say, I don't care what the label is. Are you testing on animals? Are animal ingredients in it? I'm not buying it, dude. I ain't buying it. It's beautiful. That's how you fight something that big. Yeah. That may not be the answer you were expecting, but that's the best I've got. I'm just curious, because that's kind of how I started to become a vegan. I worked in government, and I saw a lot of this. You know, this, like, American Me was supporting corn growers because they were supporting American Me, so it's just like this whole cycle. Yeah. I often think of, uh, of that. Uh, I'm reminded of a quote from the Buddha, which I've used before. I'm not a Buddhist, but I love this quote because what he said, as it's written, that he said apparently was this. The greatest miracle in the world is to change a single thought. Allow me to repeat that. The greatest miracle in the world is to change a single thought. So, if McDonald's brings out a veggie burger, and I'm sure you all have feelings about that. <laughs> but let's just let's just give me a little runway for this for a minute. Let's try this. So the guys, the people who eat at McDonald's three times a week, either budgetarily, geographically, whatever the case may be, ignorance, who knows? It's all they know. They probably have their staple go-to menu items on that one that they choose from. They don't even have an option if they were to change their thought and try something different and break their pattern, the option doesn't even exist. If we say, don't support McDonald's and putting a veggie growth, don't give any money to those corporate blah, 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 those guys have been killing animals forever. The greatest miracle in the world is to change a single thought. I just interviewed, you'll see it in the film we're doing now called Overhaul, we interviewed a hog hauler the guy is a trucker and he moves pigs, just like we see at Farmer John's. And he said something so profound, he said, I think it's more difficult for people to change their religion than to change their diet. The greatest miracle in the world is to change a single thought. Think of the thoughts that you are completely identified with, that are you consider a core belief, and that you come into collision with others over, because you will not budge on this. It's the same way they feel about food. Let's do it by age. Give your phone. Get your calculator out. 
Let's take an average age, 40. You've been eating animals your whole life, okay? 365 days a year times three, because you probably eat some kind of animal product in some way, shape, or form three times a day. What's the number? 1,095 times 40. Let's just say 40. 43,800. A 40-year-old person has eaten animals at a meal 43,800 times. Talk about a layer cake of identity and core belief into what they feel is who they are. And you're gonna come along with your little vegan meal for lunch one day and shatter 43,800 times of reinforcement. Compassion, compassion, inspire. Try to help them with love and compassion and attraction in some way to inspire them to change a single thought. You're going one time up against 43,800. That's my advice to someone who might be trying to go vegan. Try it. Try it one time and maybe I'll try it two times. But let's not push these people away or get them preoccupied with other feelings about defensiveness or now revenge. Let's try to inspire them because we're going up against a pretty big number and they come by it honestly. That's how they've been raised. Anyone else? We'll go there, there. Who's that? Oh, sorry. Hello. Hi. Um, so for people who are already vegan, um, I know there is like a stigma with um, well, with certain people with kind of identifying with uh, veganism, kind of maybe leaning towards more plant-based or something like that, not really wanting to identify with the bad stigmas of veganism. Um, how would you suggest that um, people who are vegan kind of ward off the bad stigmas or create a better um, image of veganism to people who aren't uh, <laughs> vegan? Isn't it weird that there's a bad stigma to veganism? <laughs> How did that happen? So strange. Peace and love and kindness, and somehow all this angst came up. Well, we're human, so uh, by definition, we're prone to error. Um, again, all I can say is radiate yourself. You're a part of the collective consciousness. By the law of averages, you being part of the collective consciousness helps raise the collective consciousness. So raise your vibration, raise your consciousness, and you are raising the collective consciousness. How can you not? You're not apart from it. You're not separate from it. You're inclusive in it. So Gandhi, be the change you want to see. So you'll rewrite it by the way you carry yourself. I said this before, um, so forgive me if it sounds repetitive, anybody's heard it before, but years ago when the Prius first came out, you know, they reinvented the Hummer too. Y'all remember this? They brought the Hummer out, the new Hummer too. It was a big deal. They sold a lot of them. In fact, the Prius and the Hummer were both, <laughs> were both the number one selling car. And if that isn't a measure of humanity, I don't know what is. So um, 
sometimes these things happen simultaneously. It's it's a uh, it's a <laughs> it's puzzling. Um, I don't know where the Hummer is now compared to the Prius, so it may have fallen off a little bit um, overall. Again, it's like the collective conscious statement. There's almost pockets of consciousness. You can see it in a way when you drive through any city or any area. You can see in an area where they care about maybe their landscaping, they care there's not so much graffiti around. You can see other areas where you can see almost, it's a generalization, I admit, but you can almost see a pattern, a grouping of people, either like attracts like or something to that effect. <coughs> So other countries catching up at different speeds is just something beyond our, beyond our control. Again, you're part of the collective consciousness. Be the change, tip of the spear, lead the way, and um, hopefully others will follow and be inspired to follow. Um, I was just curious, being that voting is coming up really soon, um, what your thoughts are on Prop 12 and how you think us as um, animal rights activists should vote on that Way to put me on the hot seat for that. <laughs> yeah, I've seen two arguments for that one going both ways. You know, don't do it. It's supporting um, um, welfareism. You know, I don't know. I don't know. I am an abolitionist through and through. Obviously, and yet, you guys, I have no illusions about the different levels of mankind. I don't kid myself for a second. I'll take the win wherever I can get it, and I do not like to feel that I have some sort of judgmental supremacy over other people because they don't see what I see because I wasn't vegan for 27 years, and I walked around eating it, wearing it, drinking it, buying products that were used, you know, the whole thing. Truth be told, and I bet most of us are the same way, I take no pleasure in judging my fellow man because they have not yet evolved to the point that I happen to discover through some journey that I randomly was taking in this life and found things. For some people, that might be a gateway. They didn't care before, like my brother. Give him a little more space, and maybe that will evolve into something else for him, and one day he'll put it down. I don't know. For the rest of us, don't give him that. That's going to comfort them in to keep doing it over and over again. It's an individual choice. Each one of you will have to make it yourself that day. Sorry, I can't tell you which way to go. Any last questions? Yes. Hey, thank you for being here. Um, what would you say to those who might watch this film and, um, and especially those who haven't been exposed to images like these and, and this reality? Um, those who might like lose hope and slip into depression and uh, yeah, I mean you know where I'm going with this like what do you have to offer those people who may not be ready for this and they may come across it um, or anyone who's new to this and not right. it's a funny thing to be exposed to something like this because in many ways we have been uh, the average teenager has already witnessed 15,000 murders in their lifetime through comic books, video games, television, movies. 15,000 murders is the statistic for your average teenager. Um, the level of violence on this planet is extraordinary, staggering. We have been exposed to it. Um, this particular instance seems to be uh, a completely helpless, weaker being that can't communicate itself, being exposed to something like this. This is not, these are not willing combatants, like in the boxing arena or something else like that. This is different. And it is, um, It's like, it, when you see this stuff, as you all know, it's like being struck by lightning and your, your life is measured before you were struck by lightning and after. 
something died in you and, and, this, and a new you is coming out of this. Um, it is overwhelming. The, the numbers are enormous. I can only imagine what the um, abolitionists, how they felt at a time when slavery was not only sanctioned by the government, but was a world phenomenon, was completely expected. To come along and start saying, I don't think we should do this anymore. I mean, they must have thought they were at the base of an enormous mountain that they needed to climb. But, you know, it's funny, it's like that little tiny blade of grass that somehow grows up through a New York sidewalk or that slow drip of water that penetrate, penetrates an enormous boulder and splits it in half. Um, we, for whatever reason, have come into this existence at this particular point in time and, and see this, we have recognized this. Maybe we didn't see it before. I don't know what it is about people when it comes to suffering. We don't want to look at stuff. Well, we do, we pay to go see horror movies and look at stuff and sit in the dark and be entertained watching pain. It's very odd, fantasized pain. But there's something else at the same time that we don't want to look at stuff for some reason. Yeah, it just, um, we don't want to see it. And yet, you know, how many of you have bought a new car and suddenly you see that car all over the road? Right? Everybody has the car I just bought. Everybody has my car. I mean, everybody has the same car. I thought I was an individual. I was the only one who had this car. Those cars were always all over the road. You just never noticed it before. Your eyes have been opened. And now the problem seems insurmountable. It is not insurmountable. They did abolish slavery. They continue to abolish slavery to this day. Um, but it is not like it used to be. At the time of Christ, as it's written, they would crucify people on the way to Rome, right outside the gates of the city. As you were walking into Rome, there were bodies lining the street being crucified. What city were you in? Were you in Woodland Hills? Sherman Oaks. Can you imagine if people were being crucified as you were driving into Sherman Oaks? <laughs> we don't do it anymore. We evolved past it. Women fought for the right to vote. Are you kidding? Women? Unheard of. The president, at the time, whose name I forget, was the number one enemy of the women getting the right to vote. And they didn't stop. And he's the one that had to sign and make it a law. And he's the one remembered for giving women the right to vote. It's incredible. More and more people are waking up to this faster and faster and faster. Um, all I can say is that you're in the arena with the rest of us. You wanna be on the right side of history if we're gonna draw sides for a moment. Um, you're part of the collective consciousness. Just please listen to your inner self do the best you can with whomever you happen to intersect with. And um, um, you can only do one thing as activists. You can really, really, truly, truly only do one thing as activists. Hope that you have a positive effect. That's it. Thank you so much, Sean. Um, just like how the movie Dominion concludes with uh, some positive footage showing the hope that we have for humanity and the planet. Um, we thought we'd remind everybody that this year, two very hopeful things happened right here in California. Number one, fur has been banned in Los Angeles. Incredible. Starting January 2020, it'll be illegal to sell products with fur. And also SB 1249 passed, which will get rid of cruelty-filled cosmetics in the entire state of California. Um, I also wanted to, uh, you know, after watching a film like this, if, if 
you happen to be feeling a little down and hopeless, there is always going to a sanctuary. And we happen to have Nikki here, who is amazing and love always sanctuaries. Right here in the San Fernando Valley, she, she has over 80 animals. And it is so rewarding and, and, and replenishing to come face to face with those whom we are trying to help. Uh, so I would strongly encourage you to follow Love Always Sanctuary on Instagram and keep your eyes open for visiting days. Um, it, is, it is a paradise. Um, and for those of you on a different note, oh, oh yes, we, have, we will hand out little, little pamphlets. Um, for, for those of you who have not yet attended a vigil, um, we host, uh, LA Animal Save hosts, uh, a vigil, a pig vigil on Mondays, uh, Sundays now, Sundays, at Farmer John. Um, so please follow LA Animal Save for the time and also Animal Alliance Network on Wednesdays. Uh, we also host a chicken vigil and a cow vigil. So, you know, vigils galore. If you, if you would like to bear witness in person, there is no, there is, it's, it's so powerful in, in getting the word out there. You being the face and the bridge between the animals and your family and friends, we feel is a very powerful and effective way to communicate a message. Uh, because it's not just, you know, you uploading a video that someone else shared. It's you, you know, showing your family and friends that you care and that you're fighting for them and that you would like them to at the very least care about you caring. You know what I mean? Yeah, tomorrow night we'll be there. So we're all coming together tomorrow night. I think three groups. Amy can talk about it, but it's a March of Silence. She's going to pass out flyers. It's LA Animal Save and it is Animal Alliance Network. We're all going to be there tomorrow. I think James Aspie's in town. He's visiting, great speaker. So please, if you haven't been to one, come down. And like, make no, if you have nothing, make no excuses, just come down. You will not regret it. Um, it's a very powerful, thought provoking uh, experience. So if you haven't been, please, tomorrow night, 7 30. Thank you. Um, that, that concludes the QA. Oh, we have one more question. Uh, hopefully, I don't know. I know they've submitted it to several. The big hope is the documentary festival. Yeah. It might stand a better chance. Um, <coughs> I don't know. They they can be political. They are mindful of whatever city they in they're in, who the vendors are on the main streets of that city. Truth be told, so we'll see. I Thank would consider that. hosting a, a screening yourself. I mean, whether it doesn't have to be. You know, at a theater, it can be at your home with uh, family and friends, other activists who, or vegans who haven't yet watched the film. Uh, there are various ways of, of getting this out there. All right, well, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. I guess I'll conclude by saying what Natasha and Lucas say, going vegan is not the most we can do, it's the least we can do. Thank you guys. Thank you. Have a good night. Okay, thank you very much everyone for tuning in. This is Lindsay Baker live for Jane on Jane. And we are just concluding the Q&A here in Sherman Oaks at the screening of the movie Dominion. Thank you very much for watching.